God created the world. God created man and his drum. But more than anyone else, God honored the griot because he gave him the good word. Rice is bland without sauce, a story is flat without tall tales, and the world is boring without the griot. Well before the day when antennas could broadcast images and words, there were traveling poets and musicians, the griots. Since time began, they have been the mediators and masters of the spoken word, the memory of the society and its oral tradition. In a society without a written language, they alone preserve the history and tales of their people. Thus kings and presidents have used them, because the media have always served power, and the men of power like to pay their way into history. In 1990, unbelievable events are occurring in Africa. Masses of people rally to demand democratic rights, free elections, and a greater number of political parties. Soldiers, despots, and crown thieves are chased from the presidential palaces. After 35 years, most African states have attained independence from external European colonial powers. Today, their citizens are fighting for internal sovereignty, a second true independence. Throw out the despots. Nineteen sixty eight. The Colonel Musa Traore, a young officer backed by a small section of the army, takes over the country in an overnight coup and, aided by Western powers, declares himself president. In 1958, France grants independence to its colonies. Modibo Keita is elected president and representative of the newly independent country. Mali moves towards socialism. The tricolor flag is removed and the yellow flag of Mali is raised above the state palace. This day is one of pride and glory for our people. It is also the day we honor our heroic soldiers who fought for a free Mali. On the second day of September 1960, our people began to build a new society. We are free from all forms of aggression, of foreign domination and exploitation. We are building a new society, a socialist society. Mali called and the president answered. Mali has become independent. Mobido Keta came to us. When Mali called out, he roared this lion, and Mali became independent.
Ah, c'était des années exaltantes. These were wonderful years. We had to work hard because we really believed in what we were doing. We had a goal toward which we were working and struggling. I was the head of the radio station, the director of programming, and also the head of the information ministry service. I was already quite well known as a journalist. Everyone listened to what Abdul Sai had to say on Radio Mali. We began with the education of the people, and one of the first measures of our government consisted in explaining to the population of Mali, via radio, the new political agenda of the party and the government. In order to help the people buy radios more easily, the government removed customs duties on imported radios. We even gave radios to villages that couldn't afford to buy them. And we installed loudspeakers at major intersections so that inhabitants could hear what we had to say. The president uses radio as a tool for building his young nation. Modibo Keita understood from the beginning that radio is the only media capable of binding the long African tradition of oral storytelling. In addition, radio is the ideal means to reach across Mali's great distances of time and space, and thus help create a single nation out of a multitude of different peoples. Oh Mali, oh my country, the voice of Modibo hails your salvation. I learned a bit about doing radio when I was in Cologne, at the Coche Well, and then there came an offer from the Federal Press Bureau for a humanitarian aid project in a country called Mali, which was then just barely six years old, to teach people how to do radio. I had my tiny office, two and a half meters by three and a half meters, in a small radio broadcast building. There I built and soldered my M5. I had the microphone in an ashtray, headphones hanging from the ceiling, which I pulled toward me when I wanted to use them, and we were completely surrounded by equipment everywhere. We received enormous crates from Paris filled with magnetic tape, but the Malians, of course, wanted to get away as much as possible from the former colonial power. So it was good that we also received tape from the Voice of America in Washington, as well as tapes from Prague. Around the mid-1960s, Mali was a microcosm of the Cold War situation. In the bookstores of Bamako, we can find books from Russia, America, France, and Africa. Is this something you intended? And if so, for what purpose? In a way, it is an expression of the political freedom of the people of Mali, which means that we do not, a priori, exclude any single culture. But this does not mean that we believe every word we read in those books. In terms of the media, the revolution pinned all its hopes on radio. In 1967-68, there was one newspaper, which printed barely 5,000 copies. Circulation barely went beyond the limits of the capital. In other words, hardly anyone read the paper. The rate of illiteracy was about 90 percent, and television wasn't available back then. Radio was the only means left of reaching the public. The political direction was clear. The Ministry of Information gave precise ideological instructions. All news stories had to pass through the censors, which could take several hours. 
And it was my colleague, Abdul Sai, who was basically the quasi-director of incendiary propaganda, and who read, in a voice of stone, all the Stalinist commentaries on the invincibility of socialism. We stopped making our own cynical comments on the subject, and, while I don't know how Abdul feels about it today, I think back then he must have been laughing at himself. No, censorship didn't exist. It wasn't necessary. There was what I would call auto-censorship. Do you understand the subtle difference? There was no censorship bureau that gathered all the newspaper articles and radio reports so that a decision could be taken. You can't call it that, no. The journalist himself, who knew the political direction and point of view of the government, knew exactly what he could tell the people and what he could not. I was sitting there one night at the radio, and through the narrow corridor I heard for about an hour and a half, American imperialism, American imperialism. I was going crazy because I had to listen to it hundreds of times. Finally, I went to my colleague at the other end of the corridor, and I said to him, listen, what have you been doing for the last hour and a half? He answered, well, a new textiles plant was inaugurated by the Chinese ambassador, and he gave a speech that contained the phrase American imperialism 150 times. It had to be censored out. I asked him why, since American imperialism did exist, it was the time of the Vietnam War, Hanoi was being bombed, etc., but he said, no, we are still a neutral country, and we won't allow one ambassador to denigrate in any way another country that also has an ambassador here with us. That's why my chief censor ordered me to cut out the word American 150 times. You can imagine the amount of work involved, and it had to be done well, so that listeners wouldn't notice the cut, so that they wouldn't hear each time, imperialism. I lived a few hundred meters from the radio station. One day, our cook came into the house and said, Sir, there are so many soldiers in the street that I think the military has taken over. And I said, I must get to the radio station. If the soldiers... No, no, you mustn't go, he said. I went to the radio station anyway, and I saw all the machine guns entrenched on either side of the main entrance of the radio building. I went to go in, and the soldier said, White man, what are you doing here? I said, I work here. Okay, then you can go in. All my colleagues were gathered together and being held underneath a tree. A speaker was blasting military music in the yard, and the next day when I went back to work, they told me, don't come back for the next three weeks. All we're going to do is broadcast speeches of devotion to the new regime. Musa, the husband of Mariam, you the son of Daba Traoré, no one can challenge you. Musa, you are the number one. From the Ivory Coast to Senegal, everyone speaks of you. You are the number one. We people of Mali all sing only of you. It was a coup d'etat. For a month, the military was searching for me, but they didn't find me. When the military junta took power, they destroyed right away all the archives of Radio Mali, the political archives as well as all the musical ones. There were even musical tapes that were destroyed simply because the name Modibo Keita was on them somewhere. All of this was done publicly. They ordered, come on, bring out the audio tapes, and if the name Modibo Kaita is on them, they must be burned. The dictator and his court. Moussa Traore makes all the journalists his personal spokesmen, but they can only say what the government wants to hear. The radio station ORM, the single newspaper ESOR, and the television station created in 1983 maintain the dictator's influence over the people. Freedom of the press does not exist. It is a monoculture via censorship.
Supported by France, the dictator has even managed to get the media in the north to sing the praises of his corrupt regime. Nonetheless, in the 1980s, resistance begins to boil up within the city. The students and cultural leaders have other dreams and aspirations. They write, publish, and are prosecuted. I personally experienced censorship. Until 1988-89, the free press didn't exist. Back then, secret tracts and pamphlets had to be distributed clandestinely. I myself published one of the banned magazines, and the whole editorial staff ended up in jail. I had to spend 11 months in the big prison in Bamako. Prison life under Musa Traore was hard, very hard, and I personally didn't even witness the most horrible excesses. It was insufferable. We were often more than 70 people in a 12 meter by 6 meter cell. It was awful. Toward the mid 80s, opposition leaders form a nest of resistance. The Jamana Cultural Cooperative publishes political reviews, cassettes, and a magazine. One of the founders is historian and journalist Alpha Konare. People censored themselves. And we said, it's time for this auto-censorship to stop. We had to unburden ourselves. And we were conscious that this was a sort of cry that we launched throughout the country, and that we hoped would find an echo so that others would hear us and respond. We were fighting for the freedom to meet and exchange ideas. It was with this objective in mind that we founded, under extremely difficult conditions, the first independent non-governmental magazine. I recall that we wrote and laid out the articles for the first edition of our magazine on the floor, on a straw mat. In the beginning, many people didn't dare to even read the magazine in public, and certainly not write for it. There was the auto-censorship, of course. People were scared. But little by little, they began to read. And they wanted to write for us. Letters to the editor soared. People brought us articles. It was a good sign. That people agreed with us or not didn't matter. For us, what was essential was to see them growing braver. Because it was important for us to conquer this terrible silence. People had to say what they believed and had to learn to say no if they thought no. Nineteen ninety. The thirst for liberty and the economic hardship drive the people of Mali into the streets. In protest demonstrations that last months, they demand democracy and free elections as well as freedom of the press and radio. The one-party system of dictator Musa Traore responds with a brutal crackdown. Soldiers fire into the crowd. The radio, press and television report nothing but lies to appease the dictator. I filmed footage in March 1991. Early in the morning, I went to work as usual at the television station. On the way, I saw barricades everywhere. Once I got to the office, I told my colleagues that the city was undergoing an event of major importance, and that we, as journalists, couldn't close our eyes to it. I then went to the director and asked to use a camera, but he refused. It was pure and simple censorship.
The events were extremely important. I went quickly home and got my small amateur camera, and I filmed. During the two days, I was the only one to film anything. I it's our duty as cameramen to record the important events. Let's do it for the collection. Racine's amateur videos are copied in large numbers and secretly distributed to avoid the censors. They incite the anger of the masses against the regime and encourage calls for change. The leaders of the insurrection send the videos to Europe for broadcast, thereby revealing to the world the shameful violence of the political regime and the people's insatiable thirst for liberty. I was being closely watched. The comrades didn't want me to go out because they knew I was specifically wanted by the government, because I was the leader of the student movement. Radio Mali was used to representing things the way the government demanded. But as the democratic movement grew, Radio Mali was rapidly being forced to listen. The families of employees began to feel the pressure, and the journalists finally decided to work correctly. The was now in the hands of the insurgents. It was no longer the state TV, it was the TV of the democratic movement. And finally they broadcast the most important news. Moussa Traoré had been arrested. One of our most important demands was for the fall of the regime of dictator Moussa Traoré. This was finally realized thanks to our determination. Fittingly, an officer of the paratrooper division delivers the coup de grace to the former military dictatorship. He himself arrests the hated president and talks with the heroes of the revolution. The army will remove itself from politics and will return to the barracks. The army will protect the constitution. The army will submit to elected authority and will serve the people of Mali. This is all there is to say. The officer keeps his promise. For the first time in the history of Mali, free elections will be possible, thanks to a new democratic constitution. Several parties present candidates, and the radio and press adopt public positions backing one or the other party. Nonetheless, the people must first learn how to use this new liberty. Under the former dictatorship, they would vote by raising their hands, now, many older people need help to learn the new secret ritual of the voting booth. In 1992, Alfa Konare, historian and journalist of the Jamana Cultural Club, is elected president of the country. I swear to remain faithful to the Republic to respect the liberal constitution and to make sure that it is respected. I swear to exercise my mandate in the best interests of our people, to preserve the democratic gains and to guarantee the national unity and independence of our country. I was elected president on the basis of a platform, and I therefore represent a majority in our country with which I share essential values. 
avec laquelle il partage des valeurs essentielles. Pluralism of the press and its freedom are important to me. The government will help the Malian press through specific measures, because our media must grow and become strong. The whole world knows that a free press is absolutely necessary for democracy to survive. We must have more newspapers. Throughout Mali, we must have more free radio stations. The muzzle is removed. Speech is free. But since three quarters of Mali inhabitants don't know how to read, and since a television set costs too much, radio remains the only means of widely disseminating information. Its listeners are hungry for news, and producers arise to fill this need. Some local radio stations depend on support from a political party. Others try to earn money, but most are content to present personalized programming. Radios are often set agencies, parties, donors, or other forms of participation. Today, there are more than a dozen free radio stations here in the city of Bamako, and there are at least 50 more throughout the country. My fervent desire is to see that each city has its free radio stations, because I believe very much in these local radios. Radio stations that broadcast in the different regional languages and that create dialogue between the different ethnic groups help democracy and contribute to our true liberation and development. Just listen to these stations. Here. Please, take my radio. Look at my little radio. This is Bamakan. This is Kledu. Here is RFI. Africa number one. This is Kaira. This is Radio Mali 1 and Radio Mali 2. And this is an Islamic station, which isn't broadcasting for now. And this is Radio Liberty. So you see how wonderful it is to stroll through the airwaves. At each moment, on each of the different broadcasts, someone is expressing an opinion. It's fantastic. We must preserve the airwaves so that we can finally feel free. You are listening to Radio Cairo, the voice of happiness, the voice of those who cannot speak. Our radio plays a preponderant role in the life of our people in the life of Mali's young democracy, a democracy that is in full development. Think a moment about how much time it took Europe to arrive at democracy. And today, we've only just begun to learn about democracy. For 23 years, the people of Mali had to wear a muzzle, and only the rule of the dictator held sway. He was not with me is against me. A different opinion was not tolerated. But today, that is finished. The people of Radio Kaira aren't just anybody. People of national importance have gathered here. You will find the number one Democrat, who was sufficiently pursued under the former regime, Umar Marika, 
is the number one revolutionary. We at Radio Kaira do not receive any foreign aid. We broadcast news stories that are different from the stereotypical stories you get with the larger media. Kaira seeks to present information and opinions that are close and important and useful to the life of our citizens. The other radios aren't like us because we have a common vocation and a cooperative organization with a clear national objective. This distinguishes us. I am happy that Mali is the country with the most free radio stations in this region of Africa. I hope that this trend continues, that it grows quickly, that it reaches other cities, and that in the big cities each neighborhood has its own small radio station. And these radio stations will allow the numerous ethnic groups, whose experiences in the various regions are quite diverse, to meet and better understand one another. Because of the negligence of the colonial period and the two successive dictatorships, there are few schools in the countryside. Small radio stations that broadcast in their own language are beginning to crop up. They are often created by farmers or the village teacher. They create their own program, assuming responsibility and managing the radio station. These radios will play the role of school for hundreds of villages. In Africa and in Europe, all have faith in you. May he be praised, the lion. May you be glorified, Alpha. You are a true leader. In France, in America, and in Germany, all have faith in you. You deserve all glory and honor. They have removed the muzzle, yes, but many still find it hard to quench the thirst for complete freedom, the burning of books in Bamako. 1993, the opposition media incited the students, and it's the Jamana Cultural Club itself, the very nest of resistance against the dictatorship that collapses in ruins. I never would have believed that one day students would destroy the Jamana Cultural Club. I myself know what Jamana did for the students. I myself was a student when I first came to Jamana. Here is where the printing press was. I used to work at the machine right there. The students came and set fire to part of the bookshop. They forced open the door, entered and took the books. Then they got some petrol from a street vendor to start the fire. Unfortunately, the fire spread in all directions. This is what shocked all of us. This is what we deplore. When I saw the damage, I was extremely sad. 
For those who did it and thought they were thus helping the democracy, I have pity. We cannot pretend to fight for democracy when we burn down a bookshop and destroy archives, or when we think we can silence a publication by setting fire to it. You know, learning how to become a democracy is never easy. Many people claim to fight in the name of democracy without having any true sense of democratic principles. In following the Malian press, you can see that it is not easy for me today to be the leader of this country. I will tell you something. I don't expect to be hugged by the press. These people must do their research honestly and to make their judgments in a just fashion. They must do their professional work according to a code. This for me seems extremely important. Today, more than ever, I believe the media reflects the health of a democratic Mali. Radio Kaira doesn't enjoy the saintly odor of those in power. In fact, Kaira scares people. Kaira upsets them, and that's why we're proud. They cut our electricity and they sabotage our programs with parasites. We believe these are the vestiges of the former domination of a single party. Democracy is really still a school for us. There were moments when this radio station called for rebellion, a military putsch. We can't accept that, can we? I never would have imagined that I would have to close down a radio. But there are several publications and radios with a criminal potential, capable of committing crimes that they may seriously regret. There are rules for living together. The law does not protect any radio station that calls for violence. In what country in the world do you think that could exist? Nowhere, of course. That's what I call pure restriction. This is an obstruction of democratic principles because it discourages the critical spirit. This seems only natural. We are learning. We must learn to be critical, but we must also accept criticism in order to progress. But in the jungle, strange voices emerge from the world beyond. Strange sounds, words and tales of Dallas and Denver. The voice of the masters of the word will vanish. They have remained silent for centuries, and today, when the muzzle has fallen, and they finally recover their own voice, they risk to be drowned out in the din of the digital weapons of desire and the psychedelic highways of information. The men have been silent for centuries, and today when the muscle falls and they finally recover their own voice, it disappears in the babble of television series and digital weapons of desire coming from the north. What is the griot compared to the Hollywood mogul?
I am for total freedom in broadcasting. I want to favor the development of free radio and television. But we are facing a fundamental question. In what framework are we to accept it? Should we free the air just so that it can be enslaved again by the financial powers? Have we liberated our broadcasting frequencies so that foreigners can use our nation's radio and TV like a Trojan horse to occupy our territories? Haven't we liberated the air for something better and grander than that? CNBC is first in business. First for live global coverage of business events. First for in-depth information about personal finance. Nous même on reste un peu we only play a small role. Look at all these satellites and all this stuff that falls down on us from everywhere. I think that very soon we won't be able to see ourselves in all of this. They are colonizing us now with their media. We can't ingest it all. We can't compete with all these people who are so well equipped. We don't even have the means to maintain our own radio and TV stations. And it's always the same colonialism. We are obliged to look at what they send us. We can't produce programs ourselves because we don't have the money. But we love our culture, our language, our radio. But what can we do if we lack the means? We are caught between the anvil and the hammer. If the hammer comes down, we are destroyed. If the anvil is removed, we fall into the abyss. Our roots are being removed. The tradition of their genesis keeps them on their guard against the midnight robbery of words that are transformed into the preaching of evil. Some religious believers already curse TV as an antenna of Satan. Only their poverty can save them. It takes a Mali farmer 12 years to earn enough to buy a TV set. From time to time, I have a little problem with my children. For a long time, for example, the TV show Dallas was a big hit on Mali television. I can't stand the show. Each time it came on, I would get up and leave. The children, meanwhile, with a child's innocent curiosity, wanted to see it. I said, no, it's no good. No, father, let us watch it. We don't really believe in what we see. Well, then I say, if you promise me that you won't believe in all those false images, then... But it's so repugnant. There is no morality in these shows. No morality whatsoever.
The radio is my voice. The radio is my book and my song. It breaks the chains of silence and misunderstanding. The radio is a well that makes the flowers blossom in our village. The radio is my breath and the wind that carries my voice beyond the frontiers. Allah, 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 Allah,